Welcome to Your Stories Podcast, where we hear candid stories from people conquering cancer. I'm your host, Brenda Brody, and I am happy to welcome Steve Cooper to the podcast today. Steve had a hoarse voice for years until he finally was diagnosed with larynx cancer. A surgery to remove his voice box left him unable to speak. Now, with a prosthesis, he is able to share his story with us today. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Brenda. Let's begin talking about the symptoms that you had before diagnosis. You were hoarse for a number of years. As your cousin, every time I saw you at a family function, your voice became worse and worse, almost so we could barely understand you. Can you kind of walk us through what were your symptoms? Well, initially, I would get laryngitis, and then it would get better for a week or so or less, and then it would get better, and it would come and go. And then it got to the point where I got laryngitis, but it did not did not go away. I just let it go. I didn't have it. Um, you know, it was probably out of fear. Sure. Um, everybody said, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And I just ignored it. I wanted, you know, I didn't realize what the ramifications could have been. Sure, sure. And then there was that, you know, famous call from your cousin, Brenda, i.e. me, that basically the whole family had said, get him to the doctor. And we did finally get you to an ENT. Yes, I went to a um, actually a very well known ENT. He did a laryngoscope, larynx, laryngoscope, and he said, um, "It looks like your vocal cords. You have paralysis." So I said to him, "Is it cancer?" He said, "No, no, it's not." But I want you know, I'll send you to a specialist who who deals in things like this. I go in and see the specialist, and she said, um, "The doctor hasn't provided us with the." Um, with the photos, we would like to do another scope. And it's actually on a screen, a um, monitor similar to when you're in the dentist. You can see the whole process. And she had a, uh, an associate there and inserted the scope. And I could, you, you know it right away. She turned to the associate and said, do you see that? Mm. And they kept looking at a certain area, retracted the scope. And she says, you've got some things I'd like to look further at. And right then I said, from your experience, what does it look like? She said, it looks like it could be cancerous. So they scheduled a um, a biopsy and a, uh, a PET scan, which both confirmed I was diagnosed with stage four uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx. And it had penetrated into the cartilage around the larynx. The first thing I wanted to do was talk to my wife, walked in the house, and I said, it's cancer. And, of course, we both cried. You know, she was very supportive. She, you know, she said we would get through this. But it's it's very emotional. You're many feelings. It's It's numbness. It's shock. It's fear. In the weeks immediately after that, I, it was denial. I didn't want to deal with it. Didn't want to think about it. Didn't want to follow up with the surgeon. Basically, you want to just, you know, close your eyes, go to sleep and forget about it. And so when you met with the surgeon, did they tell you immediately that you would be losing your voice box? He said, yes, you will be. Steve, you're going to need a laryngectomy. What was your regimen after after you you losing your voice box, knowing that they were going to then figure out what was the device they were going to give you, but they needed you to heal first? First of all, we don't realize that our voice is our personality. It's who we are. We express ourselves in so many ways. Um, being without a voice is emotionally. Is psychologically devastating. Uh, if you can only imagine being trapped in a body without being able to say a word, 
without being able to express a feeling, without being able to ask for help. Physically, we can ail very easily. Mm -hmm. What I wasn't prepared for was the emotional aspects of this. That was, and it's true with all laryngectomies. Uh, it's so far worse than the the physical effects. Luckily, I had handwriting that people could read, <laughs> writing on a whiteboard, and that's just, that's what all laryngectomies do initially. And you Another, did become the master of writing on the whiteboard. Oh, yeah. I have to say, you were able to get your jokes out and your, you know, biting little comments in very, very quickly. Once you started coming out of the house, once the, the loneliness and the depression started leaving you um, and you were able to start socializing, it was very impressive to watch you with that whiteboard. Prior to having the voice prosthesis, which I'm using now, I spoke with an electrolarynx, and I can, I can demonstrate that for you now. It's a bit hard to hear, but um, some laryngectomies. This is the only means of communication. Yes. Yeah, so this is this is the actual the way you began learning how to talk again, which was really hard. This you're going to make it sound easy, but I remember this was not an easy process. This is what it sounds like when you have an electrolarynx. The problem is there's a learning curve and it took, it took almost three months before anyone could actually understand me. That's incredible that you can speak like that because I remember in the beginning it was very difficult and we must acknowledge and have a shout out to your amazing wife and kids because they pushed you and pushed you to make sure that you were doing it every day. And we knew sometimes you cheated and just gave up. There were days that it was just, you couldn't imagine you were ever going to speak again. But how inspiring is that, that you're now able to show others that have been recently diagnosed, that there is the light at the end of the tunnel and one will be able to communicate through some type of medical device at the end of the day. And so you started with that and when did you actually then get the prosthesis that you have now? Well, first, the patient has to be um, a candidate for one. Mm -hmm. If there's been severe radiation, extensive damage to the esophagus, several other factors, they'll never be able to use a voice prosthesis. Yeah. But you were one of the lucky ones that you were not only able to use it, but again, I, I have to say, I remember this wasn't a walk in the park either. When you got it, you had to learn again now how to use it. I mean, this is a podcast, so people can't see that you actually are putting your finger on that device in order to communicate. It's, again, a learning curve that comes with all kinds of frustration and depression and what you have done as a warrior to make sure that you got to this place, you know, you, you pushed through even on lonely days when you didn't think you could do it anymore. So it's, it's amazing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the laryngectomy group support that you have become a very active participant in? I think it's an amazing, I've seen a big change in you. And, and I know that having those people who've been through it and who get it matters when you're facing something that not everybody's faced. Can you share a little bit about that group and, and what you all do to support one another? I belong to a local laryngectomy club. Um, we have meetings monthly. Being with other laryngectomies has been a, probably the biggest biggest help in recovery and moving forward and accepting this. I also act as a mentor to, to people who are about to have surgery mm -hmm. or people who have undergone surgery. And, you, you know, the fears are tremendous. The doctors, the speech pathologists will actually call me and say, I have a new patient. I really would like you to meet with them. Quick story. I was called in... Uh, Back in November, they had a patient, needed a laryngectomy, and he said he wasn't going to have it done. Mm. He wasn't going through that. He'd rather kill himself. 
Mm. So they said, Steve, you got to meet with this person. So actually, he was in the hospital. His cancer was so bad that he couldn't breathe. And I came in, met with him and his wife and uh, another family member. And it ended up being about two, two and a half hours I was there. Starting to get a little emotional with this. At the end, he reached out and he grabbed my hand. And this really raspy, well, whisper of a voice. He said, Steve, thank you so much. He said, I was, I was going to refuse the surgery. Let the cancer run its course. He said, after talking to you, he said his words, and I never remember. He says, I know, I got this. And That's uh, awesome. We find that in helping others, we actually help ourselves. That is so well said, because I look at how far you've come and now giving the gift of giving back and mentoring others, because there's nobody better to talk to a patient who's just been recently diagnosed that someone that's on the other side like you are that fought a really hard fight. And with that, I thank you so much for taking the time because this is a very rare cancer and a lot of people don't know about it. And the fact that you're able to share your stories, impact and educate others is a gift. And and I, I'm very proud of how far you've come because this has not been an easy journey. And thanks for taking the time on the show today. And thank you for um, asking me to share my story. Hopefully others will learn or um, make an effort to help other cancer patients on their journey. Uh, we're all in this together. We are absolutely all in this together. Hearing the experiences of others can help people cope with the challenges cancer brings. Please help others find these inspiring stories by leaving a review of the podcast and subscribe today on iTunes or Spotify to hear every new episode. Thanks for listening to Your Stories, Conquering Cancer. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.